Okay, welcome, Rupal. Thank you, Jojo, and good morning. It's so wonderful to be chatting to you. Oh, it's lovely to have you on Time for a Mojo Injection, and I know you're going to fire us up, give us a bit of a mojo hookup. So it's really nice to have you here, and I'm really excited to, to learn more about your story and to see what comes up. Same here. Oh, yeah. So you have a reputation for being a bit of a power woman. And uh, it got me thinking about, you know, feminine and masculine energies. Um, mm. is, I don't know if you know what the key traits are. I, I recently was sort of researching um, and the masculine, it's very, you know, very ambitious, very, you know, driven. And, and it, it was quite interesting, though, to see because some of the things I thought would be under feminine were under masculine. And it was just mm. it, it was quite interesting because um, yeah. I'm never one to hold on to labels too tightly. but. Yeah. Do you, have you sort of dealt, because obviously, you know, from war zones, like you've been full on to boardrooms yeah. and you've yeah. been in a very kind of sort of masculine dominant, uh, I'd say um, quite full on. How have you navigated your way through that before we go into the, the background? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think, you know, I often referred and sometimes still do refer to myself as a very alpha female. Um, I, I think some of the traits that you just identified as being typically masculine or male, I definitely resonate with. So ambition, drive, um, high energy, high intensity, that kind of stuff. But I also have a very, um, and I think especially as I've gotten a little bit older um, and a bit more experienced in just life in general, I've also started to develop what I think is ten, tends to be considered the most sort of female trait. So intuition and um, sort of tuning into myself and, and empathy and that kind of stuff. And so I don't think it was ever one or the other. I think as with every part of my life, and I think for a lot of people, different scenarios and different environments either activated or muted certain aspects of who I am. And it really just depended on my physical and sort of mental and, and work environment, which, 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 which personality trait came more to the fore um, and which, like I said, sort of took a bit of a back seat. So it was never, anything that I sort of consciously navigated, but there were definitely these tension points where, you know, not to over overplay it, but in those heavily alpha environments, boardrooms, war zones, military cultures, the CIA, all of these things, I often would find myself being the only woman in the room or maybe one of a handful, small handful, especially as you know, sort of get to the higher decision-making levels or definitely the only woman of color in the room. And so it, you know, again, this idea around different parts of your identity being activated or muted, depending on the scenario, I found that there was this tension sometimes of, of, Hey, you know, I have to sort of put on a certain more of a certain alpha uh, persona and mute more than I naturally would. Some of the, the less, uh, the, the more sort of feminine traits of who I am. Yeah. That's hard, isn't it? Because you kind of want to, yeah be you know just in the moment yeah. and what feels right but sometimes yeah. you feel like we need to compensate if you're in that extreme environment yeah and i think definitely that and and what it's almost sad to say but i remember co there coming a point where i stopped noticing when i was the only woman or the only person of color in the room and and just sort of that became the given, you know, that it wasn't even something I, I paid attention to or tuned into anymore because it was just so, it seemed so normal and, and sort of unavoidable that I, I almost, I stopped noticing when it was the case and stopped noticing that, hey, wait a second, there's a very sort of specific view on things that were going down because of the demographic makeup of this room or of this decision-making circle, or it just, it, you know, it, it, it started to be take something I took for granted instead of something that I consciously started or thought to challenge and thought to find ways to push back against. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting and I think so many people feel that way so it's great that you can sort of talk openly about that. Um, I'd love to know before you know like your background or how you you came to work for the CIA and it's, it's such an amazing achievement and you know a lot of us will know from watching things like Homeland and stuff like that <laughs> like some stereotypes in there but talk to us about how you got into this 
Yeah, so I have always been, as I said, sort of high achiever, highly ambitious. What I was one of that kid in school who would leap out of my chair when the teacher asked a question and, you know, wanted to be the smartest person in the room. And so my career sort of took me through a series of just very highly intellectual environment. So I went to, you know, um, Ivy League schools, and then I got a master's degree in international affairs from a, a prestigious American university. And it was while I was there that I was recruited to join the CIA. Um, and it was largely due to this sort of very, um, I guess, sort of brainiac <laughs> tendency that I have. And also I had foreign language skills. I'd spent a few years living over, or not a few years, sorry, some of my college undergraduate time living overseas. And so I think the makeup of both my academic background as well as some of the things I did outside of my academic career was a really good fit for, for the type of work that one is you know, required to do at the agency. So yeah, so I was recruited while I was finishing my master's and um, a year later, it took a, a, almost a full year to get have them do my background investigation, which was very, very thorough. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a year later, I, I started my career there. Wow. How did it yeah. feel? Did you, did you love the experience? Oh, Jojo, it was pretty much without exception one of the most formative and fantastic experiences of my life. I was surrounded by really smart people um, in the work that I was doing. I felt like I was contributing to a, a part of history in a way, you know, the, the war zones and the, the, the war on terror, as we referred to it back then. It was, yes, for all of its, uh, all of its sort of, I guess, political weightiness, it just felt like the right place to be at that time. And also as a New Yorker, I was, you know, literally I was a senior at university finishing my last year at university in New York when, when the Twin Towers came down and I could see them coming down from my, the, the window of my dorm room. And so all of that, that sort of cultural, social, political environment in which these big world events happened, it really felt, important to me to be a part of it in, in a meaningful way, in a way that I felt I could contribute. And so, you know, like I said, it was formative, it was formidable, and I got to do work that really mattered to me and with some people who were amazing. Now, it wasn't, you know, sort of without its challenges or without its difficulties or anything like that, but it, you know, that sense of a higher mission, a higher purpose, and working with other people for a sort of a bigger thing it really you know it sort of resonated very deeply with me it's just amazing it's amazing mm -hmm. and it's funny when you you speak about 9 11 i remember where i was i'd literally flown back from new york um oh, wow. just to sing at a friend's wedding or i would have still been there and the mm -hmm. day it happened i remember where i was sitting when i heard about it and i got my photos developed later that afternoon it was back in the days where you you go and get your pictures developed <laughs> yeah there was a a photo of me at the top of the Twin Towers doing a selfie thing and yeah. I, I was just crying. I, I just can't believe they're yeah. not there anymore. I can't believe the devastation this has caused. And actually yeah. when I was leaving New York, um, the taxi driver was going off on one about something really big was about to happen. Mm. And he was talking a lot about God and he was talking about humans and he was talking about the evil in the world. And yeah. it was like he knew what was about to happen thinking back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that conversation sticks in my mind. I actually wrote about it in my journal. But would you say like a moment like that was a real, whoa, I, I need to do more? Was it a real sort of pull mm. to get into that role? Yeah, and it's interesting because now that you, as you were talking, I, I, you know, I started to sort of get chills putting myself back in that, that mindset and that time of my life. And, you know, it's hard to say if it was a conscious decision for me to, to you know, choose the line of work that I did, or if it was just something that felt natural and I was naturally drawn to it anyway. But it was such a big thing, both as a New Yorker um, and then also sort of on the flip side, again, as a person of color who uh, saw some of the backlash against the, the, you know, the brown communities in America at the time. Um, and it just, 
again, like I said, it, it wasn't like a straight line thing where, you know, 9-11 happened and I was like, I'm going to go and join the CIA. It was, these are huge life events, huge issues that I am both personally and almost sort of philosophically grappling with. And I think it sort of guided the decisions that I made that led me to then sort of being recruited by the agency. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You, mm. you, you speak about having this drive and always being the one to kind of speak out. Where did your mm. confidence come? Because obviously there's lots of very intelligent people that, that mm. lack that confidence. They, don't, they know answers and they, they want to express themselves, but they just can't. What? <laughs> Think this was just something you were born with or uh, I think academically I was far more uh, at least in school I was definitely far more confident at putting my hand up being noticed making my voice heard and I think that changed quite a lot when I went to university actually because all of a sudden I wasn't the smartest person in the room I was just average you know everybody around me was equally capable equally smart in their own way um, and it, I remember going through that very specific um, a, a couple of specific instances at, in big lecture halls, for example, where I was so desperate to make a point or to ask a question or to respond to the teacher, to the professor's question, excuse me. Um, but then my heart would start racing and I'd think of all of the reasons that it was a stupid thing to say or it was obvious or somebody else would have thought of it and if it was worth putting out there anyway. And so I would shut myself up. So it's interesting. I think if I had to sort of chart my life, it's sort of and my confidence levels, I think it, it's, it's not a, again, it's not a straight line or like a, a, a line that just constantly goes up. It's a bit of a wave. And, you know, I started out confident in school and then sort of a little bit less so in expressing myself openly at university. And then it, you know, sort of got, went up and down again, sort of throughout my career, again, in different environments. But I think one of the things that was really great about being at the agency is there's this strong culture of, tr of speaking truth to power. Um, and that, that phrase comes up all the time. And so it encourages you to be the, the voice that people need to hear, even if they don't want to hear it. It gives you the tools and the support, you know, with the, the other people in your, in your working environment to, to feel okay when you put yourself out on a limb, when you, you know, you tell a decision maker or a policy maker, hey, look, this is the reality versus what they want to hear. And so I think that was, again, another real key turning point for me and my confidence around having my voice heard, around speaking up when I, you know, felt things weren't, Right. Um, and it was something that was culturally, again, at the agency, very, very highly encouraged and supported. And I think that was one of the biggest, biggest things that I took with me after I left was, you know what, actually, yes, we all have a responsibility to get yeah, not just make our voices heard, but you know, speak truth to power, to stand up when we see injustice, big or small, you know, it could be, you know, sort of telling, you know, a kid not to bully another kid, or it could be standing up to your boss when, when they're being unfair to a colleague, you know, we can be advocates for each other um, in big and small ways, in ways that feel right uh, and true to who we are. And that was one thing that, like I said, I've, I've definitely carried with me um, pretty much since then. That's amazing to be able to go into that power. It's, you know, I've been there myself when something hasn't been right and I knew I should have said something, but I'm kind of like, oh, I don't want the drama. I don't want the drama. And yeah. but then there's likewise been other times where I've known it's not right and I've gone for it. But I've created drama that probably didn't. I could have yeah. perhaps let the anger die down, have a bit of empathy for the other side and then put my my point across in a more kind of uh, grounded way so it's mm -hmm. it's that extreme of when you've let someone slide that you shouldn't of or when you've yeah. perhaps taken it to overdo far. it uh, how do you how do you get that balance right I, I don't think it's something for me that I've ever just gotten right and then it sits in that sort of right uh, position forever. For me, it's almost on a scenario by scenario basis. So I don't want to oversimplify things and say, oh yeah, you know, I got really used to, to being confident and speaking up and speaking out and, and I do it all the time. It's, it's for me, it's a daily uh, sort of conscious work that I have to do. And, and as you rightly said, you know, there are times where I'm like, gosh, I wish I hadn't bitten my tongue. I should have said something. Or other times where I'm like, oh, maybe I, I was a bit too intense and I really could have dialed it back a bit and, and had my point made much more powerfully in a less intense way. Um, 
So it's not, it's not just a one and done sort of thing. This is something that I still work on um, very consciously to this day. And as I said, you know, it's, it's very scenario dependent. Um, but I think the good thing as with everything that we all, you know, want to work at improving and practice at, it gets a little bit easier. And that, that voice in my head, that's like, Oh, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I, it's easier for me to know what is the right way to go. The more I practice, like I said, sort of using my voice when, when I think it needs to be heard. Yeah. And it's, it's so important and it's encouraging people to, when you get that feeling, be it, you know, mm. I don't know if you get the feeling if it's in your gut or your heart or your chest. Um, for me, it can often be like, yeah, you get that gut feeling that something isn't yeah. right and you need to do something. Yeah. You can feel your heart beating and it's like, but you can, as you say, it's a daily to do, you know, and we've all maybe seen <laughs> okay. and something yeah. can creep up to haunt you. And, uh, yeah. And I think as well, as you said, it's scenario based. We all have different triggers. So something could really break my heart and someone else is like totally overreacted. Well, no, because that's my lens and that's my history mm. and past experiences that have given me that passion. Whereas we all have different passions and things that really set us, set us off, right? Well, and you know, the one thing I will say again, especially coming at it from my optic as a woman, you know, being a woman who sort of speaks truth to power, we also have to factor in other things like our physical safety in ways that might keep us quiet more than we would like to be. A very small example I can give you from last summer. I was out with my um, my young daughter who was at, the, at the time was three um, and uh, my husband, and there were some teenage boys who were catcalling and saying some really obnoxious things to a group of teenage girls. And they were literally like a meter away from us. So, you know, my three-year-old was hearing this, watching this, and I was just not having any of it. And so I turned to the group of boys and I basically told them off. And I was like, look, watch your language and please don't speak like that in front of young children. And then, you know, they started mouthing off at me and blah, 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 blah. Um, but after that happened, you know, I had to sort of sit back and think, because I was like, if my husband wasn't there, would I have felt safe enough? Yes, I was in public and, you know, in broad daylight, but would I have felt safe enough challenging them if I didn't have that sort of physical protection sort of guaranteed because my husband was there? Now, again, this doesn't necessarily mean that the boys would have, you know, tried to do anything physically aggressive towards me or my child, but it is another thing that we have to factor in as women that I think is not to be underestimated. And so, you know, going back to this idea of it being scenario dependent, we have to be really careful about the expectations we put on ourselves and how much we sort of beat ourselves up for not saying things, mm -hmm. because sometimes we have other bigger considerations that we have to factor in. And that is, is equally important as, you know, making sure your voice is heard. And so it's, it's, as I said, it's constant work, it's constant practice, it's scenario dependent, it's developing an instinct. And then it's also finding ways to, to put your voice out there in a way that you feel um, is, is right for the situation, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in the moment you do something, maybe you write an, a, an article about it, or, you know, you, you, you write a letter to your MP about something or whatever it is. So, you know, it can come in lots of different forms. It doesn't ha just have to be sort of standing firm and standing up in the moment. Yeah, that's true. It's nice to have time to reflect and then perhaps put something pen to paper. And I know we both love to write and it's such a, a great healthy thing to do. I mean, for you, obviously it was, it would have been such an amazing experience in the CIA, but really full on. Um, I don't know if it's like we see on TV that the hours are extreme and I don't know if that's the reason why you, you've gone into something else, but can you talk mm. to me about what your decision, what influenced your decision to, to leave and to create this yeah. amazing business that you've gone on? Yeah. To? Oh, gosh, it was a couple of things. I think, as you said, very rightly, it can be really full on, not just with the hours. I mean, there were times where extended periods of time as well, where I would be working anywhere from, you know, sort of from like 7 a.m. to about 2, 3 a.m. Now, it, it wasn't consistently like that, but there were times where it was a sustained amount of just full on effort. But what got me through it was, again, this sense of purpose, the sense of bigger mission, and the fantastic people I had the privilege of working with. I mean, if it was not for those people, I could not have sustained it for as long as I did. Um, and so I think there was definitely, as you said, a lot of intensity, a lot of it being very, very full on. And I loved it. You know, I, I had given myself so completely to it. It was, it was a as I said, a privilege to work there because I remember for basically the bulk of my time there, 
waking up every day at 6 a.m. and being so excited to get out of bed and ready for work. And that, you know, I had a conversation with my dad at the time, and I remember him saying, he's like, Rupal, if you have found that thing that gets you excited to get out of bed every day, never let go of it, you know? And so the reason I decided to let go and to try something else was, to be honest, it was, I don't want to call it burnout because it, it, that's not really sort of doing justice to it. But I think I was both mentally and emotionally just drained. It was the work that I was doing was really, really uh, wonderful in some ways, but it's also really frustrating in some ways because these are big global political issues on which you can only have so much of an impact. And, you know, the, the, for me, I'm a bit of an idealist in that I want things a certain way. And if they can't be that way, then I get really frustrated, you know, and there's only so much that I can continue to, to do um, as part of, you know, contributing to being part of the problem. And so it was around sort of, I was there for just around six years and it was around, let's say year five that I started to get a little bit just sort of itchy feet and it was both you know like I said being a little bit drained and also just thinking gosh you know I've had so many fantastic experiences here I've learned a lot I've been trained in some amazing things things that I would never been able to do before or, at, or in any other environment but I wanted to see if I could sort of hack it in, in, a, in, a different, in a different environment. And, you know, I wanted to also make a conscious choice of leaving on a high note. So as opposed to sort of spending a career somewhere and then, you know, going through these ups and downs and you just sort of, you know, it becomes just something you do and, and then you retire at age whatever. I was like, no, I, you know, I want to be as excited as I am now every single day if this is something I do for my life. And, and I was starting to lose some of that. And so I, I said to myself, you know what, let's try something else, totally different, totally new. Um, see if I can hack it in a different environment and um, and basically test myself. You know, I'm the type of person who needs new challenges, who likes to test myself and 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 push myself in different directions. And so that's what I decided to do. So after you know, as I said, around you know, um, after six years, I, I I submitted my resignation and I I launched out into the big wide world of of, of business. <laughs> and that was that was uh, yeah, it was. I think, you know, it was um, a bit of an awkward transition for me because I, the way I did it was, you know, I went and I got an MBA at London Business School and it was such a different environment to the one that I had just left. I mean, any environment was going to be different to the one that I had just left, but it was so different. And in some ways it was amazing. It opened my eyes to to, to jobs and to careers and to possibilities and, and, and things that I didn't even know, know existed. Um, but in other ways, I sort of missed the intellectual stimulation, the physical stimulation, the, the, you know, the mission, the purpose, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I had, I spent those two years really doing a lot of sort of soul searching, navel gazing, whatever you want to call it, to decide what would come next. And I didn't want to just get a job. I wanted to have another career or another calling. Um, and so that, you know, that process of the, sort of that two years, I, I often think back at is, on it as almost a bit of a sabbatical that allowed me to really explore or at least start exploring some of the questions that I never really had the time to, to ask myself when I was living in such a sort of fast paced, high intensity world. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. you were, so you were soul searching and you were like, right, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> and then yeah like and and so what I mean what came of it to be honest the one big answer that came to me and this wasn't a surprise when it did but was like I don't actually ever want to work for somebody else mm -hmm. and I don't and I want to have a bigger big a bigger positive impact on the world mm -hmm. now those were the two very vague things you know you could go in a lot of different directions and I, you know, I'm also a very practical person. And so I told myself, okay, well, look, you don't necessarily know what the thing is that you, you know, is going to be your calling, your sort of life's mission, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. But I also knew that in order to find what that thing was going to be, I needed to do something. And I also needed to very practically take care of, you know, my, my living expenses and make sure that I could, you know, support myself. And so the first business I started actually was in was in real estate, was in totally different environment, totally different, um, you know, industry than anything I had any experience in. And for me, it was both 
um, a bit of a passion project because as a lot of people, I love transformation. I love improving things. I love the before and after, adding value, all of that kind of stuff. But I also knew it was going to be a means to an end. The means, the, the end being that it would allow me to buy back my time so that I could then pursue perhaps another business or, you know, again, get a little bit closer on, on that journey towards finding my, my calling. And so that's what I did. And, you know, it took a couple of years for it to, to really sort of build momentum and, and to take off, but it did. And uh, a few years later, you know, we were doing well enough to where I was able to retire my husband and, um, you know, he, he left his day job. And so at that time, now this is back in sort of 2018, I thought, what have I, you know, again, I sort of sat down and did a very reflective exercise. What do I love? What environments do I thrive in? What, you know, if I'm looking back on my life's journey to date, what are the themes that are coming up again and again? And the themes that came up for me consistently was I absolutely love, 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 love to develop an expertise at something and then use that expertise to help other people. And I love to write as you, know, you, you alluded to earlier. And so I thought, gosh, okay, let me start thinking, just let's, you know, be a bit creative, a bit expansive about how could I make a life or of, of, of expertise and sharing and writing and creating and, and, you know, engaging with others. And that's when I started Entrepreneur, which is what uh, is a community now that I've created for, for leaders. Well, I refer to it as community of leaders, change makers and, and founders. And the idea really is for me to leverage the experience and the lessons I've learned from both the CIA and from becoming the CEO of my first business to help other people who are on their life's journey and, and helping them uncover the answers to the questions they're asking about purpose, meaning, you know, career, all of these kinds of things. And really to help, you know, sort of through, through coaching, through speaking, through writing, through workshops, all of these various things to help people basically just get out of their own way mm -hmm. and achieve the things that they want to achieve in their life and in their career. Yeah, it's so important. And, and there's so many people probably living quite a mundane life because they've not got the tools in place to make that change. And it's, it's so important. I mean, what would you say to someone right now who's at a bit of a crossroads? I would say, to be honest, the biggest influence is well, one of my favorite phrases captures it perfectly. We are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. And I think anybody who, well, this is true always but it's sometimes particularly important to be conscious of who, the, who those influences are when you're at a transition point or when you've set yourself a new target or a new goal or something that scares you because, you know, and research bears this out, you know, we're the average intellectually, financially, with our weight, with our health, all of these various indicators of the five people who spend the most time with us, we spend the most time with. And, you know, having, if, you know, if people sit down and actually do an inventory, an inventory of, of those influences, I think it will probably surprise them because, you know, we just sort of fall into routines and ruts and we forget that our, our social and, and mental surroundings have a massive impact on who we are and what we do. And so those influences can, can sometimes be in the form of, you know, the five people, but it's also, you know, the five films that you watch, the five musicians that you, you listen to, the five podcasts that you listen to, whatever it is, you know, these are all mental um, influences and inputs that we, you know, the books that we're reading, the, all of that stuff. They have such a powerful impact on it. And so I would say if you do an inventory and an assessment of what those influences are and you find that they're a little bit lacking or they're, they're not you know, helping you achieve whatever it is that you're trying to achieve or you're striving for, then maybe it's time to sort of upgrade it a bit. You know, it doesn't mean to sort of slash and burn your personal relationships, but maybe start participating in, you know, I don't know, online forums where people are doing what you want to do or, or listen to a podcast like, you know, your podcast, for example, where people are giving very specific insights and tips on, on mojo injections and, and increasing your energy and your engagement with life in a way that's meaningful to you. Um, but I think we have to be so, so protective of our, of our brains and our headspace because all of those influences have an impact. And, it, and if we just sort of coast through and let the default set in, we'll never be able to change or, or be able to, to see the, you know, the impact that we want to see in our own lives and, and, you know, make the transitions we want to make until we sort of up level or upgrade or whatever you want to call it. Those, you know, those five big influences in our lives. 
Yeah, I think that's such a key point. And it, as well, it's saying that we don't have to, you know, we can still love those that are perhaps mood hoovers and they love an exit. <laughs> yeah. um, we can still give them love, but it's how yeah. we view and how we perhaps step back from gossip or we step back from toxic. You know, small. what do they say? Small-minded people talk about other people and then it's the leaders that, that talk about growth and development and learning from mistakes yeah. and stuff. And exactly. we can all get sort of swept into those small-minded patterns, but actually we're, we're made for more than standing gossiping about someone that we have absolutely no idea what's going on in their life. We're made for more than judging others. We're made for more. Have you ever been in a scenario when you felt someone has judged you and, you know, sort of, you know, you felt like a sort of negativity there and how have you dealt with it? Oh, uh, you know, again, this is, I think, something that for me has been uh, sort of a, a, um, a work in progress, something that I'm always having to, to consciously, um, yeah, just work at. So, you know, I can't think of any specific single example. Well, actually, no, I'll go back to my childhood. And I will say I was always a very, very self-conscious person. I always felt I was being judged. And uh, sometimes it was it was valid and sometimes it wasn't, but I think I was very conscious of, uh, of being different, you know, so of coming from an immigrant family um, that both looked different and spoke differently than sort of the typical, you know, child where I, uh, or person in, in, the, in where I grew up. Um, and I was always very conscious of, as I said, of sometimes being the only a brown person in a room or the only woman in a room or, you know, the only person of uh, the only American in a room, depending on where I was. Mm -hmm. um, and so this sort of self-consciousness, it, it almost made me hypersensitive to uh, perhaps perceiving judgment that, yes, definitely sometimes was there, but mm -hmm. oftentimes I think wasn't there, but I just felt very, very conscious that I was different in some some meaningful way and the way I've processed it over time as a child you know I did a very I think sort of at the time natural but also very self-destructive thing is I just tried to blend in I just tried as hard as possible to be as sort of quote-unquote white as possible or as quote-unquote alpha as possible or in any way to make myself less of me and more of what I thought was you know, considered normal. And I don't think that's a good thing for anyone. But again, as, as children, I think you sort of can expect that kids don't have the tools necessarily to, to engage these things in, in, a more, um, in a more productive way. As I became an adult, I think what I've been able to do is really to just start to tune people out um, and to care a little bit less about what other people think. It's not, as I said, something that I've just fixed and that was forever you know the way I am it's a it's always a work in progress for me but I think what's happened over time is having built up a bit of a resilience and a bit of a, of a thick skin again going back to the CIA one of the things that you were judged on is your intellectual rigor and on the quality of your analysis on your presentation all of that stuff and I loved being in that environment where it was, you know, sort of gloves come off and you get really hard feedback that you may or may not want to hear. But I loved it because it helped me be better. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I always at my core, if nothing else, I always want to try to be better. And so having been in that sort of very, very intellectually intense environment where you are sort of called out and pushed and challenged and all of these things, it really helped me also develop a thick skin and also just accept that feedback can be helpful. And that thick skin, again, is something that I took with me into the big wide world after I left in this sort of feeling of like, okay, well, people may be judging me, that's cool. Like I care a lot less than I once did because I you know, have developed a thicker skin. And yes, it, you know, I'm still sensitive to it sometimes, but the time it takes me to bounce back from feeling like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that or I wanna shrink into myself or you know, conform to something or shut up or whatever else, you know, I, I can have a talking to with myself and get myself out of that sort of reflexive mode of wanting to just, you know, sort of change me and turn it into something productive. So a very concrete example from a couple of years ago, um, I had, you know, I have a, have a newsletter list and I do a lot of workshops and webinars and, and I'd sent a, a very 
I thought innocuous email to uh, my newsletter list saying, hey, I'm going to be doing this webinar. And, um, you know, people signed up and, you know, I, I posted in some public forums. So, you know, people signed up for it publicly. And uh, it was a business webinar. It wasn't anything controversial. And I got the most obnoxious registration. It was from somebody who said, who put in as their email address, what they wanted to do to me at gmail.com. So clearly it was like a totally fake, yeah, uh-huh, a totally fake email address, I hope. Uh, but I got this and it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my gosh, should I shrink what I'm doing? Should I be less out there in the world? Should I, you know, am I putting my family at risk? Like all of these crazy things from one hostile email. And it really, it, so it was. It felt like a bit of a judgment that, oh, well, this person wouldn't have done it if they thought what I was doing was of value or if, that, if I was a man, perhaps, or all of these other things come flooding down. And again, all of that self-consciousness, that sort of childhood remnants of insecurities come crashing through. And I, I had a, a very sort of serious moment of like, oof, should I maybe stop doing my webinars? Or should I maybe, you know, sort of only tell people I know about them so I know who's looking at what I'm putting out there and all this sort of self-protective stuff. And then again, like I said, I sort of had a good talking to you. I, t I turned to my sort of support network, which is some, you know, really close friends who are also founders and, you know, sort of care about making a positive impact on the world. And basically, this, this whole cycle took about a couple of hours. And then I was like, you know what? No, screw that person. Oh, actually, that's what they said they wanted to do to me. But no, so screw mm -hmm. that person anyway. <laughs> And I'm going to just keep doing me because what I'm doing, the work I'm doing is more important than this one jerk. It is going to have a positive impact on all those hundreds of other people who signed up to it and didn't say these horrible things. And it just, you know, it made me feel that much more, yeah, just sort of, like I said, confident to go forth and, and focus not on the naysayers, not on the people who are judging, but on the hundreds of other people who I want to help. And that for me is the biggest lesson around this idea of judgment and, and self-awareness or self and self-consciousness is always making sure that my purpose and my why is bigger than any fear of judgment, any fear of failure, any fear of being called out or shamed or, you know, made fun of or any of those things. And also to recognize just very basically that this is just what happens. And, you know, there's that saying of like, nobody kicks a dead dog. Well, when you're putting yourself out there, when you're trying to help people, when you're doing something bigger outside of your comfort zone, outside of other people's comfort zones, you, you put yourself, you expose yourself for some of this stuff. You know, it's that idea of sticking your head above the parapet, but I don't want to live a small shrinking life. And so it's finding my own way to deal with the judgment that comes and then also to just to start to tune it out and to recognize it as just part of the process. It's not unique to me. It's you know, I've heard stories, hundreds of other people who have been targeted or, you know, trolled and all of these other things. And it's sadly just part of what comes with the territory. And so it's acknowledging that having some great people who I have around me who get what I'm doing and who are doing it themselves to sort of talk me back from the brink uh, if I ever sort of, you know, start to, to waver. And it's also, like I said, just developing a thicker skin and knowing when to take on feedback and when to just shut people out and tune them out yeah shut them out tune them out and, and just not take it personally yeah. it's never ever personal um no, it's not. I think when we're involved in the bigger picture so when you're full on your purpose and your values and your passion yeah. the the stuff it just becomes irrelevant and and it's yeah. also so good to to look for your cheerleaders as well you know yeah. i put a post out last night very vulnerable raw post mm -hmm. and you know, people, the amount of messages I had um, just from being so honest was crazy of people saying, I, oh, thank you so much. I just can't. I can't. I'm scared of judgment. I'm scared of judgment. But I guess I've been doing this for six years now. So when, the more I talk out and, and share, you know how many people it helps. So it's actually like you just can't, you've got to focus on the bigger picture. You've got to focus on what your vision is and you need to keep that vision close all the time um, coming back to that. So for you yeah. now, sorry, go on. No, all I was gonna say is that, you know, I think people want, your audience, the people you want to reach will take what you're putting out there in the way you intend it. And so it doesn't matter about these other people. It's, you know, like you said, all of the people who responded positively and thankfully to your very vulnerable post 
that's who you're trying to reach. And that's who we have to be keeping in front of mind when, you know, if and when we are ever attacked or put down by others. Yeah, it, it's so important. And also it's knowing that you're helping people that may mm. never reach out to you. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's powerful what we can do, especially now with social media and, you know, it's amazing in so many ways, but just obviously yeah. getting that balance right as well and being able to step mm -hmm. off and protect your sleep and protect our mojo. Um, <laughs> yes. So you work with leaders and you help them to strip away the layers um, yeah. so that they're more kind of heart led, would you say? I think it's, you know, heart led has become a bit cliche, but I think the, 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 the thought behind it is exactly that. So it's heart led and it's very sort of self led. So it's not this idea of like a leader looks like this and I'm going to have to be a very sort of, you know, very bossy and very uh, arrogant and, and brush people off and, you know, my way or the highway. It's stripping all that away, as you said, and it's leading from the heart in the sense of not being about uh, bravado or, or projection or fitting into anything that is other than who you are at your core. Mm -hmm. So it's, I would say, heart-led in the sense of it being sort of very self-led, very self-awareness-led. I guess mindful is the way that I would put it, is, you know, who are you as a person and how can you best tap into your best self in order to then help bring out the best in others and be the type of leader that you would naturally be. So again, stripping away all of the perceptions and conceptions of what leadership looks like and leading in a very, in a way that's unique to who you are, who, with that amplifies your strengths, that sort of, you know, uh, allows you to just be more naturally you. And, and, and I say leaders in the sense of leaders, Yes, who are at the top of and running organizations and companies, but it's also leaders of smaller teams. It's also leaders of, of people, you know, people who are leaders of their own lives. So it's looking at leadership in a much bigger way instead of just, okay, well, this person's title says, you know, CEO or C something or manager something or whatever. It's yes, those people are, are definitely leaders, but in many ways, I think a lot of other people are looking for ways to be leaders, both in their careers and in their own lives. And my part of what I see as my role is helping them, like I said earlier, get out of their own way and uncover what leadership looks like for them and help them then you know, bring themselves out there, use their voice, be, be seen, be heard, help others, all of that stuff that comes with it um, in, in a very, very authentic way. Mm -hmm. and that's what we all want that's what we're all looking for these days right <laughs> yeah. to be yeah. the buzzword so you yeah. it's great that you you're able to help to help people do that and to strip mm -hmm. strip away the the nonsense and to get yeah. to get right to that place how yeah. do we know you know because they say all oh, you know know your value and stuff but can we have too many values are we meant to just mm -hmm. pick like five or or three or what do you say to people they're like <laughs> I just want all the good ones. Like, what are all the values? I'll take them all. And then you're exhausted trying to live up to every single value every single day. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, my, my, my position on, on everything is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. So there can be some, again, like we talked about earlier, some values that get activated in certain scenarios and then, and some that you actively mute in other environments. And, you know, this isn't something that you just, again, decide these are my values. And then that's what happens all the time. It's work. It's consciously working towards or away from certain values and certain things. And it's also deciding what is natural to you. I think one of the, the most powerful exercises that we can all do and that I do with, you know, everyone that I work with is again, tuning into what our lives are who we are as people by looking at what our lives have been like to date and, and identifying those key moments and those key scenarios in which we felt we were at our best, we performed our best, we felt our best, we were, you know, in every way we can possibly think of, we're thriving, we're doing well, felt full of energy, full of purpose, all of those things. And then really analytically looking at, okay, well, let's unpack this. What, what was I doing? Who was I with? What kinds of activities was I engaged in? What were, what were some of the values that were coming to the fore in these scenarios? And now, how can I find ways on a daily basis and with the world in which I currently exist to bring more of that into it in a way that feels natural and right and is appropriate. And so it's not just a, an, like I said, an all or nothing exercise that, okay, well, I, you know, I want to be kind and, and happy and this, you know, all of these various values and I'm going to force it into my life. But it's 
actually what have I proven to myself is my, are my values through the things I do, the people I interact with, how I have an impact, all of these things, and then analyzing it, dissecting it, unpacking it to find ways to bring that more and more into our everyday lives and our everyday role. I love that because it's sort of the proof is in our actions, right? And, yeah, exactly. Uh, so it's looking at that as a verb and right, how do we, right, let's, let's do a little bit of work there and what are these yeah. key, really picking out the key moments and the best days of your life and how you felt and how you want to show up and yeah, I think that's a really good tip for people actually. And, and you've put it so perfectly, Jojo, this idea is like our actions tell us what our values are, you know, because we can, we can be so good at lying to ourselves, partly because of sort of social pressures, you know, social media pressures, familial mm -hmm. pressures about, oh, well, I should care about this, or I should, this should be my values. But to be honest, we know from our, our behavior and our actions, what our values actually are. Mm -hmm. And there's a great, great book, um, called The Big Leap by a man called Gay Hendricks. And in it, he talks about very something very similar where he was talking to a client of his. You know, he talk, there's this um, thing in the book at the, uh, where he's talking to his client and she's saying, oh, well, you know, I really, really value my writing. And, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that I write another book before the end of this year. And then when he asked her, you know, what does her day look like? She said, well, you know, in the morning I wake up and I, I take the kids to school. And then when I get back from uh, dropping, doing the school run, I make breakfast and I, you know, do the dishes and I do this. And all of this various housework that she sort of put in her day. And she's like, and then if I find time before it's time to pick the kids up from school, that's when I sit down and do my writing. And he's like, so basically housework is more important to you than writing. And she's like, no, 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 I would never say that. That's not true at all. And he's like, but what you are doing is proving that housework is more important to you than your writing. So if your writing is something you value, do that first, let the housework sit, you know, and it's such, it was such a small example, but it really stuck with me because it's so, so, so simple in it's, in it's, in it's uh, insight, right? That what we do tells us what we care about. So let's not lie to ourselves. Let's be grown-ups about it. And then once we've identified where there are any potential contradictions, then we can make a conscious choice to change it to be more in align with the values that we want to, to bring more into our lives. I love that. When I was writing my book, I was I was doing a talk one night um, at yeah. a blogger's event and they were asking for tips on writing a book. And the first thing I said was, ignore the dishes, right? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> my house was an absolute hole you know I I was a mum and actually JK Rowling I've got that quote in my my first book at the start you know um how did you write a book and raise a family and she was like well living in squalor like I didn't do housework for five years mm -hmm. and I was kind of laughing because you know my husband is a, a clean freak and he wants a house yeah. in such a great way and he wants to do the dishes before anything and for me <laughs> it was always no time is precious right now I've got two yeah. kids so the dishes can wait the yeah, right yeah. thing and I would be like oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, you kind of need to you need to have that and, and you'll know yourself yeah. so you're working on yeah. a book at the moment from CIA to CEO correct yeah so that's amazing are you when is it out are you self-publishing or have you got a publisher what's your plans with it all yeah so I'm starting uh or sorry so I'm writing it as you said um it's gonna be out by the autumn ideally that's what I'm targeting um to be honest, I am a bit agnostic about how it's published. So my uh, position has always been to just put it out there as soon as I possibly can so I can help as many people as possible as soon as possible. Uh, so the long answer to your question is that uh, I'm going to be looking for traditional publishers uh, because for me, you know, I think there are lots of benefits to having a traditional publisher behind me. But if it's taking too long or if you know if there's if there's not a right culture fit or expectations or whatever it is then i have no problem self-publishing it but yeah the, the aim is to get it out by the end of this year that is so exciting can't wait yeah. to read it uh, thank you it, it's amazing when you can put all of your experience into a book and you've got that and you're like yes and it's also legacy for for your yeah. family you know i, I think when yeah. you become a mom it really changes you and you want them to have more of you, like more of the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and you know what, Jojo, I will say, uh, becoming a mom has also made me keenly aware of how often we are role models to people without realizing it. Because yeah. now that I have a kid who I know is watching me all the time, I am very conscious of how I behave, what I say, the way I respond to things. All you know, it's again, it's not perfect by any means, and I curse like a sailor. So you know, I have to be very mindful of a lot of things. 
But, you know, it's, it's, it's helped force me to up my game. And it's also made me realize that I don't know the other people who might be watching, maybe not obviously with the same intensity as my four year old, but, you know, we are without knowing it, role models to so many other people. And it's like you said, with, you know, with your blog and with your writing, you sometimes hear from it from the people who it's resonated with or whatever, but a lot of times you don't. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, it's only it's, it's every so often that you catch a glimpse into, oh, wow, I had this impact on this person. I had no way of knowing, you know? And so it's, yes, being a mom has definitely made it very, very clear that I'm being watched, but we're all being watched by other people in ways that we might not register. So, you know, it's important to, without putting pressure on ourselves, of course, and like making it like this big thing of like, oh gosh, I'm a bur it's a burden now. People are watching and, you know, whatever. It's, it's not that it's in the more positive sense of like, we don't know how many people we can inspire by what we are doing. So we owe it to ourselves, first and foremost, to, to try to be our best, to live up to our potential, to work towards our potential. And then in doing so, we were probably gonna help hundreds, you know, or even dozens of people, or maybe just a handful of people who are watching us that we don't even know. And there's another I'm, I'm one for great quotes, and I think you are too, but one of the things that I love is this quote, I think it's Marion Williamson who says, you know, it's um, let your light shine and in doing so you give other people permission to do the same or when you let your light shine, you give others permission to do the same. And I think it's so, so true. This idea of, you know, being your best, your boldest, your biggest self and whatever, wh whatever that means to you, by doing so, you give others permission to do the same. And that's a really powerful chain reaction. Yeah, so powerful. Let the light shine. And every yeah. day we can do something to let the light shine and it can yeah. sometimes be the small things, which are the big things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 100%. Really honing in on that. And, and something I um, always ask people is a great way to shine is through music, right? To sing like yeah. we mean every word. And that's been helping me through lockdown. And um, yeah. for you, have you got a song you can recommend for people's playlists? <laughs> really, really shine and feel the mojo. Ah. Do so you know what, for me, I love Beyonce. I absolutely love Beyonce. And she, so this is a, a bit of a tangent, but for me, it's love on top because I, uh, I was in London 2012 as a performer in the opening and closing ceremonies. And it, Love on Top was one of the songs that we had to dance to, to uh, as part of our audition for London 2012. And that song just perfectly captures the excitement of the audition, the nervousness of the audition, and then just like this feeling of freeness and happiness and just pure, just like being in the moment joy. So yeah, I would say Love on Top by Beyonce. I love it. I'm going to blast it after this. <laughs> you won't be able to keep yourself in your seat. I promise you. It's so good. Yeah. Um, so where's the best place for people to contact you? And I'll put all your details in the show notes. But have you got a favorite cool. social channel or? Oh, um, I think, uh, yeah, I guess if people go to Instagram, my Instagram handle is entrepreneura uh, underscore official. Mm -hmm. Or the easiest way to get in touch with me is just at my website, which is rupalypatel.com and there you can find you know all of the stuff you want to find about me or not um, but yeah rupalypatel.com is probably the best amazing well yeah. Rupal, you've been fantastic and thank you thank you so much for showing up fully today and sharing so openly um definitely giving me a mojo injection so thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure jojo thank you for having me mm.